In the first lab of this semester, <clears throat> you are asked to compare physical and chemical properties by making some simple observations of some relatively known and potentially unknown chemicals. So before you get into that, we should probably have some concept of what physical properties are and chemical properties are. So we've got some general definitions here. Your physical properties are observable characteristics that do not alter the elemental composition. So that means if you look at the substance and say it's silver, okay, well, is it always silver? Yes? Okay, well, that's a physical property. Uh, the chemical properties describe how the compound changes its bond structure when it interacts with other compounds or elements. Okay? As a minor soapbox moment right out of the gate, I find this assignment very, very difficult. Based on your vast knowledge of all your previous chemistry classes, oh, wait, this is your first, isn't it? You haven't had any. Okay, so you, you don't know what chemical is. You don't know what a compound is. You don't know what a bond is. You don't know what a compound is. And you don't know what elements are. So pretty much this entire definition, you don't know. Okay, so it, this becomes a bit challenging for students to comprehend. What you're trying to do is acknowledge as best you can, based off the tools that you have available, the, the difference between this chemical versus physical property. And again, your chemical property takes a substance and it must interact with another substance, or potentially even itself, to change one or more of the physical properties. So we end up seeing a reaction. So your chemical properties are a bit odd because they're actually mixing things. A physical property isn't necessarily mixing anything. It could just be sitting there on its own and we just observe it. Okay? So examples of your chemical properties, you're looking at reactions. Combustion is a reaction with oxygen. Oxidation is a reaction with oxygen. Okay, so we're looking at how those things change. So our, getting to our broader term of our changes, a physical change, the chemical composition of the substance remains constant. That means we have the exact same atoms and elements all arranged to form the same compound. Cool, but if we don't know what atoms, elements, or compounds are, that becomes a difficult thing to notice. Okay? So the GIF that you see there on the upper right-hand corner is actually the triple point for cyclohexane. And so what that means is that we can see the liquid and the solid and technically the gas all at the exact same temperature and officially pressure. So what we're seeing in that uh, GIF is the substance transferring between those different phases. In each of those systems, it is the same chemical, but it appears different, either as a solid, as a liquid, or as a gas. Okay. So one of the things we have to be careful of is just because something looks like it's changed doesn't mean it actually has. Okay. When we look at a chemical change, the chemical composition of the substance changes. Okay. We have a new substance. So if we look at our unfortunate uh, gift man, when he explodes, we now have all the individual pieces of him. We don't actually have him anymore. Okay, so we've changed the connectivity between those individual pieces, and we now lose some of that chemical nature of the original man. Okay? So evidence for chemical reactions. Okay, so this is going to be the big one on what we'll be looking for. So we get four primary observations that indicate a chemical reaction is taking place. There's a big caveat there. They must not be easily reversible. Okay. We can reverse a reaction or reverse an apparent chemical reaction, and that's actually a physical change, not a chemical change. So be wary of that. So your textbook lists them out as four. I see them as really three. So one and two, I think, are the same thing. If we see a change in phase, okay, um, and that change in phase must not be heat-induced. So when we transition from a solid to a liquid to a gas, we have to add energy. We take ice and melt it into water and then boil it into a gas. We're adding heat. We are supplying the energy necessary to cause the chemical to change its physical state. But what if we don't supply energy? Okay, well, if we don't supply energy, that energy has to come from somewhere. Well, that somewhere is the chemical. 
So we're having a chemical change. Okay? These tend to not be easily reversible, whereas the heat example, that's easily reversible. I can boil water. I can also cool vapor to get liquid water back. Okay? So some big things that stand out, gas formation, we'll see some fizzing to heavy bubbling. Or in the case that we're seeing here, we've got a sodium block dropped into water or thrown into water, and it's generating a hydrogen gas, which is then causing that block to get rocketed around the lake, which is also something I don't recommend you doing because it destroys a lot of stuff. It's a bad idea. In any case, solid formed, we mix two clear solutions and we get a solid out of it. Okay, so kind of big things. Which gets us to this next GIF, which brings in a couple different things. Number one, you'll notice that we have a permanent color change. See all that yellow? Okay, that yellow is a permanent color change because it's not reversing. Okay, sort of. Okay, it's temporarily dissolving and then it's reforming and we see that yellow precipitate come back out. Pretty neat. Okay, not only is this a permanent color change, but we also see a solid. Okay, so this specific example gives us both the solid forming and the permanent color change. And where we have to be careful, this is not a dilution of color. When we mixed our species, I know it's not going to be easy to see here in just a second, we mixed two clear solutions to make the yellow solution. Okay, So two clear liquids, yellow color, permanent color change, not a dilution of the color. And then in the last one, an energy change is observed. So we could release heat, this would be exothermic, and if we wanted to quantify it, a negative energy. Or we could have absorbed heat, which is endothermic, and that's positive energy. So in our case here, if we were uh, so excited to ignite our farts, which I don't recommend, that can be very dangerous, there's plenty of gifts on, out there for that, we're releasing a significant amount of energy by igniting natural gas. Okay. Light emission, well, light is also a form of energy. So that also counts as a chemical signifier okay, or that a chemical reaction has occurred. So now we've got the kind of a baseline for our chemical and physical changes. We've got a couple examples here. I'll talk through a couple of them and then leave you to solve a couple within the video. One of the things that I want to get across in this video is that when we're looking at chemical and physical changes, we kind of dichotomize them as it's either black or it's white, okay? It's chemical or physical. And it's really a bad way to go through this. The better way to be thinking about your chemical and physical changes is that it is a spectrum, much like the rainbow. Every color is represented in the rainbow, okay? But we only reference them as red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Well, why do we only specify those colors? Well, because if I started to look at some kind of gray area in here, I'm sort of yellow, I'm sort of orange, kind of an off yellow color. Okay. Well, that's not quite as cool as Roy G. Biv. I have Roy G. Biv off yellow. Okay. That's really difficult to list out. Okay. So as a memorization technique, we have, as humans, arbitrarily built in lines to say where these things are, okay. where the individual colors are, and that's our hard categories. Even though, if I was somewhere on that line, any one of those lines, I'm not really one color or the other. Same thing for chemical and physical changes, except it's a little bit harder, because instead of having a bunch of different colors that are clearly different, we really have kind of a grayscale black-white with a whole bunch of gray in between. So you could look at a reaction and say, well, that's a chemical change. And somebody else can say, well, but if we look at it from this angle, it's more of a physical change. So some cases straddle the borderline between both chemical and physical. And depending on who you talk to, you might get a slightly different answer. Okay? That's why when we try and go through and work through kind of examples of chemical and physical, we try to pick examples that are extreme cases, okay? that are very clearly physical, red, or very clearly chemical, purple. Okay? So for instance, if we look at the melting of ice, okay, well, if we melt ice, we're taking, whoops, a solid, and we convert that to a liquid. Okay, well, can I reverse that? 
Okay. Well, what if I removed the energy? Okay. If I took liquid water and I put it into a really cold environment, I took all the energy away. Well, that was an easily reversible process. So that is best classified as a physical change, hence the red color. Okay. What about the burning of wood? Okay. Well, what's happening when I burn wood? I'm taking a solid wood, right? And then by the end of it, it turns into gas. Well, isn't that a similar just phase change? I'm going from a solid to a gas. And this is where that chemical understanding comes into play. Okay? We're not really changing this because that reverse process, I can't take the gas and make it back to the solid. That's not easy. Okay? This is a non-reversible process. And if we look at the chemical nature, what we are doing is converting our solid material that is made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and a bunch of other species, and we're turning it into CO2, carbon dioxide, and water. So we have chemically changed how those atoms interact with each other. Okay, so that becomes a chemical reaction, hence our purple color. Okay. So with that, we've got three more examples for you to go through and look at or sorry, four, we've got the dissolving of sugar, the dissolving of salt, mixing red food dye with white cake frosting, and then we've got an image down below, which is kind of a neat little image. You're noticing that our crystal is slowly changing colors, okay? and the dime is there just as a size thing. So what is happening? Is that a chemical change or a physical change to go from that yellow crystal to that purple crystal? And with that, I think I can ask maybe one or two more questions. We'll see what happens. And I do want to draw your attention to the last tricky one. Dissolving of salt. Okay, I would hazard a guess that most of you selected the dissolving of salt to be a physical change. Okay, Probably because you said, well, the dissolving of sugar was a physical change. When you add it to water, it dissolves. So we do see this change in phase. Okay, And we can remove the water and get our solids back. Okay? But it turns out the dissolving of salt is kind of a gray area. Really it's sitting probably in that green, whereas the dissolving of sugar is pretty solidly in the physical change. So why is the dissolving of salt different? Well, What happens when salts dissolve in water is that the salt separates into ions. So we end up with two separate species where we had one. That's technically a chemical change because we've changed the chemical structure. That's kind of challenging. Okay, That's a gray area one. you got to watch out for that and talk to your instructor and make sure you get a feel for what they expect from you when looking at these chemical versus physical changes. And with that, some special notes from the lab. In part A, uh, you've got this table to fill out, which has a bunch of other things in it. Uh, and one of the questions says, just by looking do some stuff with the lab. Okay, well, what does just by looking mean? Okay, well, we've got a whole bunch of different things here. We got one, two, three, four, five different things that we could look at. Can I heat just by looking at it? Well, unless you're Superman, no. So you can't heat. Solubility. Can I test the solubility just by looking at it? Well, solubility means to dissolve in another species. I'd have to add the other species. So no, can't do that. Odor. Okay, well, odor is a smell, and that requires my nose, which is not just by looking. So what it's asking you to do is to look at those first two columns and say which of those uh, species had the exact same color and form. If they have the same color and form, you should write them down as an answer. Okay, It can be one comparing to a second species. It could be three species. It could be three or four sets of three or four species. Okay, So evaluate that question more than just, oh, I have an answer. I'm going to write one answer down. There could be a lot more than that. If we look at part B, this is going to be a little pop-up question. What is at the bottom of the second lab page, i.e. the end of part B for this lab? And part C, each question has several parts, even when you only have one sentence. Okay, so this means read the question very, very carefully. Do you want full credit on your lab? 
If the answer is yes, then you should spend the time to go through and identify what each sentence asks. So how many different questions are in each sentence? There are several cases where there's two sentences and four or five questions that need to be answered. With that, good luck in your lab. If you've got any questions, feel free to polish out the details with your lab instructor, or for that matter, you can always talk to Mike if you know who Mike is.